again, I'm Sahana. I'm a graduate student at um, Stanford InfoLab, and today I'm going to be talking about a system that we've been developing. Um, it's called Macrobase, and it's a system for find basically to act as a search engine over your fast data streams. And can everyone hear me okay? Just quick, yeah, okay, great. So this is a joint work with a huge number of incredible individuals, and if you're interested in learning more about um, this project after the talk, or if you have any questions for me, or the team in general, you can feel free to reach us at macrobase at cs.stanford.edu. So many of us have spent the last couple of days here really due to this huge increase in data that we've been seeing over the last few years. And in fact, at least in the near foreseeable future, we expect our data volumes to double every two years. This is really because we've developed and capitalized on our ability to measure and collect this fine-grained information about all of the complex systems around us. And coupled with the rise of new big data systems, we're seeing that we now have the infrastructure to store, collect, and retain all of this data in a fashion that's cheaper than ever. So as a result, we see that major technology companies today, Microsoft, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google, what have you, they already report collecting over 12 million events per second today. And now what these companies want to do with all of this data is figure out how they can use it to monitor and uncover key insights into their underlying system behavior. Now what do current monitoring pipelines look like? What are current systems that actually use things like this look like? We'll go through a toy example to get a feel for that. So first, data is typically generated from some automated process. This might be sensor data, video feeds, data center telemetry, what have you. From here, this data is then collected and processed into forms that are easy to work with, just turning it into some canonical data format. Again, this is pretty standard. After this, we send all of this processed data into um, a sort of database or data warehouse for permanent storage, as well as a feed to data visualization tools and monitoring dashboards so that our users and data scientists can actually figure out what's going on with these systems, at least at a high level. Typically over this layer, you then have simple threshold-based rules and predicates and alerts in place to make sure nothing too crazy is going on. And when something crazy does happen, when an alert is fired, when a rule is fired, when something goes wrong, or I guess in a typical use case, you just get a bunch of angry emails from your users, um, you have to call your data scientists or your engineers on call to figure out so they can sit down and take a look at this data, take a look at these alerts, and try and debug to figure out what's going on in this monitoring use case. Now, perhaps surprisingly, what we found by talking to a number of companies using pipelines very similar to this, less than 6% of their data is ever actually being used for any sort of reactive analyses. And this, this seemed very strange to us fundamentally, right? Because here you have all these companies collecting 12 million events per second, right? It's a lot of data. All of you are probably collecting millions and millions of data points per second. But only 6% of it is ever actually looked at or is ever being used which seemed to be kind of a problem, right? Why is it that all of you are collecting all of this information and not making full use of it? And more importantly, we want to know is, can we use the answer to this question to figure out how we can enable more proactive, ideally automated analyses over this data to automatically figure out what's going on in our, moder in our data sets or tele telemetry? To answer this question, we actually first began by analyzing those current workflows that I showed you before to figure out what's actually going on and what the key bottleneck is. And we realized that human attention is what's actually fundamentally limited here. And it's just a fact that human attention is scarce. You can't expect humans to go in there and take a look at every single data point that's coming in. Seems pretty obvious. But now let's take a, back, uh, take a look back at the monitoring pipeline I showed you. And take, let's take a look at what concrete engineering solutions are actually in place at each and every stage of this pipeline. First thing you might notice when you look at this is that, well, there's no shortage in, system, in systems for collecting, storing, querying, visualizing, and all, there's really no shortage in these data flow engines that can do this. But when you get to that final mile, that point where you really need a human in the loop to figure out what's going on, you realize that there really aren't very many gold standard systems in place that allow you to do this. And this is exactly where that attention bottleneck I talked about before really manifests itself, right? There's nothing to help our end user, our data analysts, our engineers on call to figure out what's going on in these systems. So data flow pro engines provide a means of, you know, processing and figuring out what's going on, but they're not enough. They don't tell you what to show to your humans. They don't tell you what functions to run. So what functions do we run, right? What, what, we'll, what does cut it? Clearly, your standard select, project, and join really just are not enough. Something that most of you might be thinking of in your heads, like, well, why don't we just go to the statistics community, your machine learning community? They have tons of high-level functions that we can run for classification, explanation, what have you. But again, 
for any of you who have actually tried to implement these in practice, you probably realize that very few of them are even available up front for you to use. And even fewer of those are actually implemented and battle tested at the scale that you're interested in running in, right? It's very, very difficult to get this actually working. So what we realized we really needed and what was really missing from this workflow is a system that composes these efficient, high-level statistical operators to form the analog of select, project, and join, but for fast data analytics instead. And more importantly, we want these functions and these, um, these systems to enable users to easily make use of these operators in as painless a way as possible. And that's exactly what we've been trying to build at Stanford. So we're trying to, so while the engines from before that I talked about provide this sort of low level interface that allows you to build up these data processing pipelines, Macrobase tries to operate at this next level of abstraction, where what we're really trying to do is have Macrobase just suck in all of the data that comes in from all these initial pipeline stages and figure out, well, exactly um, how can our use, enable our users to basically compose these pipelines in a much more easy way by providing a toolkit for these efficient, higher level statistical operators. So concretely, again, Macrobase is a monitoring engine that's designed to prioritize human attention by using statistical operators, specifically in the form of efficient classification and explanation operators, together with streaming data flow. And in the remainder of this talk, I'm going to continue talking about some of our goals, as well as the architecture that ena enables this, and some of our early results while going in. So I initially actually had a live demo to show you, but due to technical difficulties, I won't be able to actually go through it. So I'll just talk about the scenario, um, show you how, how the demo might have gone. And then if you're interested in learning more to actually see it in person, you can come to my office hours afterwards. So the scenario I want you to keep in mind through this kind of pseudo demo is that you're a mobile developer and you've just released a new application into the wild. And you're trying to figure out if your application is performing as intended across all of the different um, devices that you're, that you're running on. You're now receiving reports that indicate a subset of our users are experiencing higher battery drain than others. And you're not really sure what's causing this or who's actually experiencing this high battery drain, but you want to see if you can figure out why. And what the demo would have stepped us through would be how you can actually um, use Macrobase to figure this out. And what I would have showed you would have actually been the, the Macrobase user interface, which, have, which is typically the first point of contact that most users have with the Macrobase system. And how you would actually end up using the system is to first, I don't know if that screenshot is too small, ah, you can kind of forget. So first what you would do is actually input the, the data set of interest, which I have right there as kind of the sample mobile data um, CSV file. From there, when you hit enter, what Macrobase is going to do is populate um, a list demonstrating all of the columns of interest, or all the columns present in that data set. So here you have, for instance, your app version, average temperature, battery drain, and so on. As I mentioned in the, de in the demo scenario before, we're looking for devices that ex are experiencing higher battery drain than others. So all I would do here when I'm using Macrobase is select high battery drain as kind of the metric of interest. From there, I want to figure out, well, what attributes are correlated with this high battery drain? For instance, it might be specific application versions that are experiencing high battery drain, or specific firmware versions, hardware make, hardware model, and so on. So you want to figure out, well, are any of these different attributes correlated with high battery drain? You would then hit enter, and within a typically less than a second, Macrobase will actually return results to you in this format where what Macrobase does is that it shows you that for devices matching a specific hardware make, hardware model, and app version, those data points are actually going to be what I have there. If I can, can't do that, let's point, oh. Okay, what I have here is that, uh, what's going on? Okay, so what I have here is that actually, uh, here actually is that um, these devices of the specific hardware make, model, and app version are 400 times more likely to be an outlier than not. And if I hit explore, I can take a look at the actual distribution of points returned by Macrobase. And I see here that the data points matching this combination over here is much higher than the normal base population here in blue. So what Macrobase would do would be to, so Macrobase is actually able to return a number of these results and then show you these kind of in real time so that you can take a look at the actual results that you have. Now, as an example of a more concrete result that we've attained by running this exact same pipeline over an actual data set, is that in collaboration with Cambridge Mobile Telematics. So CMT is a, uh, is a company that provides a, um, a mobile application that records driving behavior over time. And what they're really trying to do is use user driving behavior to figure out if they can provide actionable insight into how you can improve 
driving safety and driving behavior. And the question they had for us was, well, how can we tell if our application is actually performing properly across all of the different types of um, devices and models and operating systems that we're running on? Again, very similar to the demo that I would have showed you earlier. Now, why is this challenging? Why is it that CMT came to us to see if we could help them answer this question a little easier? Well, to begin with, just within the Android ecosystem alone, there are over 25 different major API releases across 24,000 different um, Android devices. And the real challenge here is that spending even one second to look at every single one of these combinations is gonna take you as a user seven entire days. And that's, if that's all you're doing, no eating, no sleeping, nothing. It's gonna take you seven days to just look at every single combination. By running their data set through Macrobase, we could actually identify um, a bug in their data set or in their application that we could then verify with their engineers. Namely, that a specific beta version of iOS had a buggy Bluetooth stack, which meant that their, um, their CMT devices actually couldn't connect to these iOS devices. And again, just by running Macrobase, we could identify this in orders of magnitude, less time than it would have taken an actual user to sift through and figure out what's going on. So now that we have gone over kind of how you might interact with the Macrobase system at a high level and some basic results, I'm gonna go into how Macrobase actually enables this sort of, um, this sort of um, root cause analysis, as well as some more um, advanced usage beyond the user interface I just showed you. So as I discussed previously, Macrobase was designed as a system that cascades these statistical operators to enable efficient monitoring. And the operators that we realize that would be most useful for our task are actually operators that transform, segment, and then aggregate our data streams. So first, given incoming data sets, Macrobase transforms this data into a form that's easier to work with for future pipeline stages. From there, the transformed data is then passed into the classification stage of a Macrobase pipeline. And all we're trying to do here is segment out our data into various classes so that we can then identify in the explanation stage, well, what actually, what, what are the key factors that differentiate the different classes from one another? What makes a data point an outlier versus an inlier? And I'm gonna take some time now to go into each and every single one of these um, operators in more detail. So first, transformation. Transformation is actually an optional step in the macro-based pipeline, and as I mentioned earlier, all we're really trying to do is find a way to encode domain or application-specific behavior into our pipeline. For instance, if you have a time series data set, we have operators that allow you to compute Fourier transforms of your data. On the other hand, if you have image-specific data, you might want to compute um, your hue or luminosity over this data instead, and pass these in as features to future backer-based pipeline stages. And the whole thinking, the idea behind these kind of simple transformation steps is that you can then compose them efficiently above one another to make more complex features out of your, out of your data. The next class of operators I'm gonna talk about are the classification operators. And here, all we're really trying to do, again, is segment and filter out my data based on different target behavior. For instance, I want to find data that's behaving abnormally from the rest. By default, what we do is provide users with a set of classification operators that identify data that's just unlikely to occur. So this might be something simple based on unsupervised density estimation-based um, techniques. For instance, this can be incredibly simple, like fit a Gaussian over my data, if my data points are more than case scenario deviations away from my mean, just flag it as an outlier. This could be slightly more complex than that as well and that you could fit an actual density over your data, your, um, your data points using kernel density estimation. And again, you get this PDF over your data and you can figure out what's lying in my tails of the distribution, mark those as being outliers. And you can then, you can then combine these with, actual, with other tasks as well, such as um, with thresholds. Going back to the battery example I had before, you might want to mark all data points exhibiting battery drain greater than 50% as being an outlier. So you can hard code that into the macrobase system. You can also do predicate-based classification where, for instance, you might want to mark all data points that came in today as being an outlier and all data points that came in from previous days as being normal and inliers and you just want to figure out what's different between them. Okay. And finally, we come to the explanation operators. Here what we want to do is just take the data that comes in as a result as the of the classification stage and figure out what really differentiates these different classes from one another. We want to figure out what behavior is highly correlated with being filtered or with being classified. If you take a look at the two data streams I have here, formatting got a little weird, and the two data streams I have here, you see that in both the error and non-error scenarios, iPhone 7, 8, and 10 are all present in kind of similar amounts. 
On the other hand, if you take a look at the countries, you're going to have to take my word for the part that got cut off. If you take a look at the countries, Canada is actually only present in the error data set, not in the inlying data set. And so this indicates that you might want to go ahead and take a closer look at Canada to figure out what's going on there, because there seems to be something that's correlated with being an error. We quantify this metric with what's known as the risk ratio. It's commonly found in epidemiology, and all it really does is tell, it tells me how much more likely am I to be an outlier if I'm from Canada versus if I'm not. So again, if you look at it from the example from the previous slide, what I would receive here is a risk ratio of five, which indicates that I'm five times more likely to be an outlier if I'm from Canada versus if I'm not. And by efficiently checking this risk ratio over a number of different attributes, we're able to pinpoint a specific subset of attributes that are highly correlated with being an outlier versus not being an outlier. Okay. Kind of completes our whirlwind tour of the macro-based transform, classify, and explain architecture. And so now I'm going to go into some more advanced usage and how people can interact with the system. So earlier what I showed you, or what I would have showed you, is the kind of basic user interface that Macrobase provides. This is the most simple point and click UI that users typically have as their first point of contact with the Macrobase system. This is how they kind of take their batch data and figure out if Macrobase is something that they want to continue working with. I keep talking about these statistical operators. We do have more operators than what are, what's provided in the user interface. In the UI, we kind of just have the most basic bare minimum that someone might want to use. If you want to make use of the other transforms that we have or other operators we have, like the Fourier transform operations and such, you can put together your own um, pipelines in Java to do so. And finally, for the more adventurous, you can actually build your own custom data flow operators and hook these up with the macro based system, Java or C++, and you can just stick it in and use it um, just as you would our own. In addition, to make it easier to hook into additional monitoring pipelines, we actually provide a JSON REST API. So how that works is first you just select your input data. Um, again, similar to the UI, just your input data CSV file, um, the metrics that you want to classify over, the attributes that you want to group the classified metrics by, and finally, the metrics that you want to use to explain your data over. Here, again, it's the risk ratio. And we have a few users that are able to use this to kind of directly hook into their uh, monitoring pipelines and dashboards. And an exciting area of active research for us is actually to port Macrobase to a SQL compatible or SQL-like interface, just because we find that most data science workflows, the kind of first way of interacting with the data tends to be with a SQL-like um, set of rules and syntax. So here we have, again, all you have to do is select your input, again, very similar to before, just a table that you're interested in working with, how you want to transform your data. So for instance, here, I'm looking at my battery drain, and I want to look at like, um, the percentiles over my battery drain. I can define classification operators over this. What I have here is that I want to mark all data points being um, in the top 5% of my data as being an outlier. Finally, you can group by the different attributes of interest and explain by the risk ratio that I mentioned before. Again, the flow is very similar across the different um, APIs, but it's just some formats are easier to integrate with or easier to use with than others. All right. So again, like I mentioned, I've been talking about these statistical operators over and over and over again, but what do these actually look like and what does it take to actually build some of these? I'm now gonna talk, take, take some time talking about some of our recent results and mainly in the form of how we've been building out new efficient macro-based operators. And even if these specific optimizations aren't necessarily relevant to the exact tasks that you have, I think the highest level takeaway from this section is just to really, kind of the insights that we use was that just because we have this combinatorial explosion in our data or search space, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to do an equal amount of work in order to process this data, right? So taking advantage of your data and tuning to your task at hand can actually enable significantly better performance without um, sacrificing any statistical um, statistical performance. So the first class of operators that we optimized were the, uh, were the transformation operators. And specifically what we focused on was dimensionality reduction. So dimensionality reduction is actually, um, it's just they form a core class of techniques for most data analytics pipelines. And principal component analysis, or PCA, is one of the key um, techniques that people use um, to run dimensionality reduction. Unfortunately, most out-of-the-box implementations of PCA are incredibly slow. In fact, in the worst case, you might find something that uses a singular value decomposition under the hood that's gonna take forever to run. 
Turns out that by using two key insights, we're actually, we can enable significantly faster performance in practice, even over these naive PCA via SVD operations. And first of all, we realized that many data sources that we're looking at, many data sources that are being generated now are incredibly highly structured and repetitive. For instance, if you take a look at the two time series there, they're very clear modes present in your data. And you can kind of see that you don't need to actually use all of your data in order to capture all of the variants in it. What this means is that we can actually sample our data aggressively before, before fitting our model without losing information. The question now is, well, how much do I sample? If I, don't sa if I sample too few data points, I'm not gonna actually capture all the information in my data. On the other hand, if I sample too many data points, I'm not really going to get the, uh, the computational benefits of running on a sample to begin with. So to guide the search of really how much should I sample, we realized that dimensionality reduction is actually a data pre-processing step. What this means is that you typically don't want to be spending more time pre-processing your data than running the actual task itself. So all we really did was start with a small sample of our data set and incrementally increase and sample an increasingly larger subsample of our data until it just becomes too expensive to continue doing so. Just by doing this, like the simple sampling until, until you've seen enough, we're actually able to enable 50 times speed ups in dimensionality reduction and over 33 times speed ups in end-to-end um, -end pipelines compared to PCA via SVD. And again, we just looked at the data properties at hand and sampled aggressively based on that. You can imagine doing some sort of clustering in advance depending on whatever your data looks like and running all of your pipeline steps on these kind of, these little samples instead. So we've also applied optimizations to classification um, operators um, in Macrobase also. We first focused on kernel density estimation and all KDE is is a technique that can um, look at your input data and give you a distribution over your data points. And how it works is that for each incoming data point, you basically um, assign it a little bump. This could be like a little Gaussian bump, like in the images I have there. And as these data points come in, you're going to incrementally build up um, your um, probability uh, density function over your data points. Given this PDF, you can then figure out regions of low density and mark these points as being outliers or inliers. As you might guess, similar to PCA, KDE is actually incredibly slow. To run um, naively over 500,000 points is gonna take you two hours on a modern CPU. And the question again is, well, can we do better? Is there some way that we can speed up the performance of KDE for our specific classification task? And turns out again, yes, we can. And all we really used to exploit was the fact that we're really only using kernel density estimation for classification. Unlike most typical uses of KDE, we don't really need that fine-grained representation of our distribution. All we really want to know is if is my point in an area of low density space or high density space so I can classify it as being an outlier or not. So just by realizing this, we can actually prune out a lot of the computation necessary for running KDE and obtain over two orders of magnitude speed up compared to running just the naive KDE that you might find out of the box. And again, here we were just using the task at hand to provide specific error bounds over the tasks that we're looking at and prune out all unnecessary computation based on that. So this can kind of be applied to a number of different other, um, other tasks that we're looking at now. Oh, that's supposed to be moving, okay. And so finally, we've been creating new operators for efficient explanation. And in this case, we've really focused on time series visualization, just because we see that in a lot of monitoring tasks, a lot of people have these incredibly noisy time series data sets that are incredibly difficult to read. For instance, looking at this here, it's unclear what's actually going on. It turns out that by smoothing your data set with something as simple as a simple moving average, where you just kind of average out your data points over time, you can get a significantly better and easier to read representation of your time series without, while still maintaining the salient features of your original, um, of your original time series. The challenge here though is how can you actually automatically choose these smoothing parameters? So given your original noisy data set, if you smooth too much, you're not only going to smooth out the noise, but also the higher level features that are present in your time series. So it's unclear how you might want to choose these, all of the different parameters that you can to smooth out your data set as efficiently as possible. If you smooth this original data set correctly, you can actually see here that not only do you see the high level trend, the overall average, but you also see these um, long-term deviations that are greater than the noise as well. So you can see these little peaks and trials in your original data set. 
So how do we automatically choose this? I'm going to omit some of the details and just say that by formulating this as an optimization problem, where we're trying to um, formally smooth as much as possible while preserving long-term long deviations, we can effectively search the parameter space very quickly and automatically determine what the best smoothing parameters are for a time series data set. There's a few quick examples of the kind of results that we see. What I have here is a time series um, Time series data set representing the number of taxi cab pickups and drop offs over a time period in New York. By applying this technique, we're actually able to see a clear dip in our time series, which corresponds to the holiday season, actually Thanksgiving, where there was a very clear dip in um, taxi cab drop offs and pickups during that time period. Similarly, if you look at this noisy time series from, that represents the average temperature in England over a couple of hundred years, just by running our um, ASAP smoothing technique over it, we actually can see very clear trends in our data. And even in the very end, you kind of see this uptick corresponding to global warming. And we actually have a live demo running at all times at futuredata.stanford.edu slash ASAP. Again, this link should be posted later on for you to take a look and play with. And again, here, all we did was we had this huge sample space, and we really looked at the, the task constraints and the different things that we had on hand to probe our sample space efficiently and figure out how we can navigate through as quickly as possible without actually running all the computation across all of these different, um, all of these different um, configurations. That was a sample of some of the work that we're doing. If you're interested in learning more, we do have a blog. I'll flash this slide again towards the end, and you can take a look at some of the different papers and the work that we've been doing if you're interested in learning more. All right, so now just wrapping up. What's next for the macro-based project? Well, first of all, many systems that most people have pre-aggregate their data into these data cubes just because storing all of this raw data, regardless of how cheap all of this new infrastructure is, it's still not quite cheap enough to just store raw data. So a natural extension for macro-based is figuring out, well, how do we apply all of these operators to operate on pre-aggregated data or data cubes instead? For instance, if all we have is access to means and standard deviation and moments and things like that. We're also looking into how we can create more efficient sketching algorithms to more efficiently compute these differences between different classes. We're focusing down with a time series similarity search and visualization literature, specifically uh, applied now to finding low magnitude earthquakes, which are actually incredibly difficult to find compared to noise. For instance, how can you pull out um, repeated noise from your sprinkler firing every couple seconds versus having an actual like, low magnitude earthquake instead? Um, we're also looking into how we can automate the feature selection process. Specifically, in the demo that I would have showed you earlier, you actually had to click which metrics you're interested in working with. Can we automate that in some way? And how can we deal with hierarchical data sources? A lot of the data sources that people get with, um, come with form natural hierarchies. For instance, you have country, state, city, things like that, or data center, cluster node. How can you more efficiently optimize your queries and run your computation quickly so that you can automatically determine which features a user might be interested in working with? And finally, we're also looking into how we can more efficiently um, perform temporal difference detection, just differentiating different um, time periods from one region to another. So just to recap, we're seeing this huge increase in need for tools that will mm -hmm. help prioritize human attention in these sorts of monitoring and um, analytic workflows. Current data flow engines really aren't enough for the task at hand, and neither are kind of the standard out-of-the-box machine learning and statistics um, uh, operators. So our proposal is actually to create um, a pipeline that combines these highly efficient, optim um, highly optimized operators for feature extraction, classification, explanation, and end-to-end -end data pipeline so that we can make it as easy and painless to monitor our data sets as possible. If you're interested in taking a look at how this actually works um, to get your hands dirty and actually try it out, you can find all of our work and all of our code online on GitHub. If you just search for Macrobase, you should be able to find it. And again, all of our work, we all have, we have blog posts for all of our work as well, so if you don't want to sift through academic papers, go ahead and take a look at our blog post to see what we're working on. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Hi, what language was used and why? So right now, um, we're uh, the base operators are all in Java, just because it was easier to integrate with the existing users who are um, who have kind of their pipelines already built in that. We're looking into, we have a subset of operators now ported to C++. The SQL interface, for instance, is all backed by C++ code. And in the future, we're looking into providing like a kind of scikit-learn type Python wrapper around it, but that's kind of much in the future. <laughs> so by downsampling your data heavily, you 
might risk of uh, uh, missing some important peculiarities. Yeah, exactly. So how that project actually works is that you have some, so also encoded into your, um, into your problem is this notion of how accurate is your transformation. For instance, if you're looking to preserve pairwise distances, you might want to compute your pairwise distances in your transformed space just to make sure that you haven't deviated too far from the original, um, original space. So kind of quality checking as you go is also performed. That's kind of how you see if you're done sampling or not. Mm -hmm. um, two questions. First of all, am I right that your tool will allow me to do anomaly detection on like server response time. So yes. if I have an API service and suddenly response times are going That's up, actually, mm -hmm. it, it can alert me. Um, the alerts, so we don't provide the alerting out of the box. So that's gonna have, it'll take some engineering kind of on your end to mm. hook this all together. We kind of just provide the underlying algorithms that you can then pass on um, to your alerting software. From, from my experience, the less the engineering team has to do, the better. So yeah. you, it's not a hard thing to, mm -hmm. to add. So I think about that and the other is, so let's say I, as a data scientist, have mm -hmm. detected the anomaly. I go and do the search, and you, oh, look, there's you know, a certain set of updates that are much higher latency than others. Mm -hmm. How easy is it for me to get the data set that produced those pictures in my favorite format so I can mm. start analyzing it myself? Yeah, so right now we actually only have our, the only users that we've, the users that we've had that have wanted this sort of functionality just wanted a CSV dump. So that's all we provide by default. Um, it shouldn't be too difficult to construct conductors to do so, though, for any format that you're interested in. OK. Mm -hmm. Because that's, like, once, I don't want to be trapped inside your system to do the analysis. I oh, yeah, for sure. So, so right starting. now, by default, we dump everything out of the CSV file. Oh. Yeah. That's so. fine. That's mm -hmm. all I need. OK, thanks. <laughs> So, um, to what extent is this a, a, a streaming system is something that doesn't look at all of the data, it looks at recent data for a particular mm -hmm. time horizon. Mm -hmm. And your examples seem to be looking at like an infinite time horizon. Can you talk about how, how much uh, state is involved in the system and, yes, and how, how you choose what is the right time horizon? Yeah, so basically this all depends on the specific use case at hand. Right now we assume that our users are kind of giving us a, a time window that they're interested in looking with. Um, all of our actual applications that are in production right now aren't, they typically operate over mini batches. So you say I want to look at a window size of this amount and then we're just configured to um, update our, our basically data structures in mini batches of that size. We haven't had a truly, a user who's actually wanted a truly, use, truly streaming use case yet in the sense that mini batches tend to suffice. Um, I answer your question? Yeah, I think I think so. Mm -hmm. Although, okay. um, I mean, it's it's kind of interesting that they 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 say that you know if you're doing analytics, uh, you you're not interested in numbers; you're only interested in ratios, because a value of a hundred might be high for one thing and low for another thing. Yes, yeah, so you're so, assuming. So you need to mm -hmm. you need to look at history to figure out what the what the nominal value is. Precisely. And then apply a a, a window over recent recent data to see how that's deviated from the the long term the long term trend. Yeah. So those are all configurable parameters, for now. Yeah. 